Hello and welcome back to Podcasting as Praxis. I'm David, my pronouns are he and him. I'm barely here and my pronouns are paracetamol and ibuprofen. I'm Jamie, my pronouns are he and him. I'm Rob, my pronouns are he and him. And I'm Alistair and my pronouns are also he and him. And it's um, back to normal. Everything's normal again. Nothing's happened. Disregard the last two weeks. And to mark this normal occasion of everything coming back to normal, we have invited on a good guest and the form of Dr. Eleanor Yanaga. Hello, I'm Dr. Eleanor Yanaga, and my uh, pronouns are she, her. Yeah, we've got a good uh, guest this week, unlike all the other times. Yeah, yeah, loving that just casual shade there, David. Yeah, that's, no, that, that's, that's the new thing. Every time someone's a guest on, we say they're the best guest and imply subtly that everyone else is actually shit. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, that. If you me. were a previous yeah. guest on this podcast and you're listening now, maybe you were the shit one and you should think about that. <laughs> oh, huge, huge slam on Sinan out of nowhere. Yeah, damn. <laughs> no, no, actually, sorry. Canonically, Sinan is the worst guest. Just like, you Guess know, no arguments. It. <laughs> uh, so Rob um, we've, we've got a lot to cover tonight what would you like to start with uh, well I thought we'd talk briefly about um, the reintroduction of material reality after the last two weeks um, and there's a <laughs> Yeah, so politics is is back or at least as of tomorrow if this comes out on Thursday when we get what, is it good it's, again? no, it's still no, absolutely dog shit <laughs> No, 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 don't worry about it. Like, it's still Britain. It's still, you know, the same. So don't worry about that too much. Um, All good. So tomorrow, if this comes out on time on Friday, we're not going to get an, a, a new budget. We're only going to get a fiscal event wherein uh, the new government... <laughs> I think that's a medical term. <laughs> yeah, I'm t- I'm, I've got a cream for it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, it's actually because if they call it a, a budget, then it has to be like scored and stuff. Whereas if you call it a fiscal event, you don't. So you can just make up any old shit in a fiscal event where it's in a budget. You know, somebody who makes a graph Real that fucking says line Calvin go up. Ball hours, isn't it? It's uh, incredibly Calvin Ball, yes. Catch a girl ca- like calling everything she writes from now on fiscal event. It's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you uh, if you submit your next book, Eleanor, you just say, "Look, it's this is it's a writing event. You don't need to proofread event. it. It's a writing event, okay? <laughs> yeah, Unbo's, uh, isn't that what Robert Galbraith publishes? <laughs> 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 if you remember from the long ago mists of time, uh, over one hundred episodes ago, actually, I checked. Jesus Christ, I, uh, we I did, don't remember. We we did one uh, uh, about free ports, which were magical places where reduced taxes meant that Fabergé eggs can like have a more frequent spawn timer. Um, oh, great, yeah. And they oh, were, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> yeah, times a flat circle. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, so they were part of the whole leveling up nonsense, and we have about eight of them. They they do exist in the UK now, um, including in the East Midlands, by the way, which is about as far away from the sea as you can possibly be. But hey ho. Um, <laughs> A free port is more of a state of mind. Yeah, vibes, though, let's be real. Port, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's why we import all the vibes. Um, England doesn't import vibes. You fucked yeah. in the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, as it turns out, which I didn't know, but like both Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss were chairs of the advisory panel that set up like the objectives and conditions for all these free ports. So they're going to continue with the new government um, because they haven't created enough business so what we're now going to get is um what they are calling full fat free ports uh which are called enterprise sorry investment zones um so they are probably going to be announced during tomorrow's uh fiscal uh, event alongside a few other nice things um they're going to lift the cap on bankers bonus to bonuses to increase competitiveness for the city of london uh lift the ban on new grammar schools cancel the rising corporation tax but remain committed to long-term cuts in the debt, in the state debt. So, you know, austerity is still on the table. I wonder where that's coming from. Mm. I, uh, I have a question. Yeah? The existence of full fat free ports implies the existence of soy free ports? No, they well, that's the ones we have now. Yeah, they're diet. Oh, I see. They're diet. Yeah. Right, okay, okay. They're, they're, they're like interesting. It is fun when we grab the magic eight ball of the economy and just give it a big shake just to see what fucking nonsense we're going to see fall out of a politician's mouth to do to continue doing the exact same shit they've been doing for the last like 15 years. Yeah, well, now they can be full fat free ports because we're getting rid of the sugar tax. 
Oh, yeah. This, I, I hate the thing about getting rid of the sugar ta- tax because I suddenly agree with Liz Trust on something. And mm-hmm. uh, that makes me <laughs> mad. And, you know, it's like the most Tory thing about me is I, I, hey, love, look. A, I love a Tory Fanta, so I do. Smash a San Pellegrino. Big treat, girl. You, you're on... Yeah. You're on a pro Iron Brew podcast, so you're just going to get agreement here, yeah, frankly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, bring yeah. back good Iron, Iron Brew. The best size um, to drink uh, Coca-Cola in is is a regular-ass can, and just give me the can. Don't give me the little can. Fuck off. I'm going to go with that. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Anna, but you might. this might actually be the second time you'd have agreed with List Trust, because there was that time she said that she would have gotten rid of the monarchy. If I can quickly furry into Scott Paul as well, the sugar tax thing is a fucking blinder, because it's going to be really funny watching Nicola Sturgeon have to try and position actually know it would be bad to bring back good iron brew. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Deeply funny I reckon to me. They're not going to bring it back anyway, they're just going to make the uh, like current stuff less expensive or something. I don't even think they need to. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. back to um, the, the the magic of the enterprise zones. Uh, briefly, is uh, so they're gonna they might create as many as twelve, uh, including one in the West Midlands, so not the East Midlands where the where the sort of the pussy Freeport is. Um, mm. They're gonna build one in the Thames Estuary, the Tees Valley, West Yorkshire, and Norfolk, uh, which is a bit weird because both Teesside and the Thames Estuary already um, have. Freeport. So beside a Freeport, they're also going to get um, Enterprise Zones. So Double Freeport. they're going to put the two cans next to each other, the, the soy one and the real one. So um, what happens if you divide a 0% tax rate by a 0% tax rate, though? Like, how does that work? Um, I think that means you implement modern monetary theory. Am I right? That's, that's how that works? Uh, Ooh. <laughs> Some <laughs> listeners going to be very upset at that joke. <laughs> So according to Liz Truss, when she, back when she was on the campaign trail in, in the before time, um, not only will we get these full fat free ports, the old free ports, the slightly soy ones, are also going to get even less regulation because they haven't lived up to their potential yet. But if we just oh, keep cutting away the regulation, the then surely, yeah. That's a problem there. If, if there. There were some regulations at all whatsoever. You know, if we could just have, you know, what if people worked just totally for free in those ports? Some kind of well, they could. <laughs> if I remember right, last time last time we talked about free ports, we were, managed to conclusively, you know, derive the fact that the only thing that would ever make any money in a free port is a guy who operates a hot dog van. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as a very mm-hmm. brief recap, that free ports are stupid and encourage crime, but in terms of in, industrial activity, they don't actually generate new ones. They just draw existing activity in from the surrounding area because it just moves inside the, the magic zone where the taxes are lower. So you don't so much create new activity as you displace old activity and then you call it new. So that's uh, that's the magic of the Freeport in a very brief nutshell. I think it's, yeah, but does someone make more money because of that? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, then the, the, the system works. I've, I've figured out what, what um, Freeport is metaphorically. It's when you've got a bathtub full of water and you get like an empty bucket and you push the empty bucket down into the water without filling it, causing the water around it to rise, and then you claim that the bath is more full. And then you yeah. throw yeah. a yeah. 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 and some pillows in there and call it a bedroom. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Only in London. That's for London Freeport. <laughs> and then you throw a plugged-in toaster in and then you're finally at peace. <laughs> um, finally free. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, essentially, so this is from The Guardian. In each area, in each enterprise zone, there will be a central region where regulations and planning rules will be eased to encourage industrial, commercial, or residential development, and the periphery where planning rules will be streamlined for housing. So we're going to get like cores and peripheries, uh, but inside the UK with lower taxes, which is awesome. And I can't wait for this to, to have good effects. <laughs> gonna build a bunch of fucking barracks around like this huge fenced off area with like the most drab disgusting looking industrial estate you've seen in your entire fucking life well you may want to live (laughs) on the uh, industrial estate alistair because uh, also the guardian according to one report uh, the treasury is considering whether as well as offering lower taxes for businesses operating in these zones it could also offer lower personal taxes for people living or working there oh good because what we need is more fucking tax codes that can just easily be avoided or loopholed and all that kind of shit. Yeah, and if you just 
buy a house in the East Midlands zone and claim that as your place of residence, then I'm sure you can just keep your giant country estate in, uh, you know, in the Cotswolds or something in a nice place. But for for tax reasons, like we're essentially going to create our own series of like little mini Monaco's, but inside the UK, but also outside the UK, because if you remember, free ports are in a country, but not of a country. So we're creating like... Onshore tax havens. Mm-hmm. Am I hearing this yeah, right? Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and also, this is from. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a better source because they gave an exclusive to the Sun on Sunday. Um, this would also include freedom from red tape, like overzealous eco rules that can block new developments. Oh, so fuck, you know, it, you know what? It fucks me off every single time we talk about fucking red tape and like construction it's never ever about fucking red tape it's about maximizing the re- return on the fucking investment in the first place yeah but it's that's the profit motives that's the fucking issue yeah but they they the code for red tape is like any legal regulation at all whatsoever that makes it you know not chill to own slave people you know like yeah that's... like stipulating that a building must have at least four walls is uh, just a burden that the the, the, the feeble construction industry shouldn't have to bear imagine how much money you could save on a mortgage if you only had to pay for three fucking walls <laughs> alistair what do you have against triangular shaped buildings <laughs> I just I, I just don't trust anything that's vaguely pyramidal shaped. I ah, see. <laughs> Pharaoh has issues with you, man. I mean, all I'm seeing in our near future is like a lot of water companies that put their treatment facilities inside these zones because it's fine because the piss <laughs> just stays in the zone. <laughs> so, so they're really literally like- they're just gonna be shitty sinkholes for taxes. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I would just Look, want to link it up to the like, skylines. It's good enough for the UK. I mean, I wanted to also <laughs> link it up to like a thought I had uh, earlier today because uh, of something we talked about on all, 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 another old episode where we talked about having um, the UK having self-driving cars on the road by like 2025 or something. And presumably, the place you'd want to test having those things on the road would be in a it's place a where. <laughs> 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 Uh, no, that's just to prove that your Tesla actually works just perfectly fine and shut shut your mouth. <laughs> it's <laughs> to prove that my Tesla can, in fact, kill a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, so essentially, presumably, you, the test, the place you'd want to test your self-driving murder vehicle would be in a zone, let's say, where there is much less regulation in terms of not just the environment, but let's say less, you know, odorous traffic regulations and, you know, maybe personal liabilities and so much of a thing in these zones. Take Taking like, a leaf out of fucking revolutionary China's book and changing all the traffic lights so that the red uh, red color is the go button is the go color. You know what? I've um, mm. I've completely completely reversed my opinion on these. I'm in favor of these free port zones because you know we're creating zones with autonomous driving robots in it, and it's only a matter of time before this naturally through convergent evolution produces a Sonic the Hedgehog, and I'm incredibly here for it. <laughs> I'm more looking forward to it, the way that we can start to call Vosa inspectors stalkers instead. <laughs> <laughs> there is a room. It contains a mythical Fabergé egg which grants wishes. Looking forward to it. That's, too, that's too definite. It may contain a Fabergé egg. Oh, yeah. It may, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's essentially like a trade-off. Like, you could move yourself and your uh, family to the low tax zone, and that could be very awesome. But then again, you could also all be killed five minutes later by an out-of-control Tesla in uh, a self-driving mode. So, you know, them's the brakes. Or lack thereof. Hey, <laughs> I was just going to say, Rob, the, uh, I'm sorry, but the phrase, you could move you and your family to the low tax zone, just hits different, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. like, it just is. <laughs> if you know, you know. But essentially what they're doing in like a broader context is just like they are creating libertarian trial zones based on like the, the Charter City model uh, developed by... <laughs> an economist called Paul Roma, and he's been trying like around the world to get these things off the ground. Uh, Prospera, the failed crypto city in Honduras, was supposed to be one. And I think some of the other like insane crypto cities that we've talked about, they all base themselves off the model of the charter city. And the charter city is like based off... um, uh, uh, of Hong Kong, essentially. What if you could create a low-tax, low-regulation uh, city where everything's just cut down to the bone and then the magic capitalism pixies come and they make everything wonderful? And that's sort of the broader picture behind these uh, enterprise zones and the free ports. 
We've had 40 years of experimental neoliberalism, but what we really need is a really targeted approach, by which I mean we need to just remove all of the laws in one, like, one square kilometre area, just so that everyone can just duke it all out, and we'll see if we can make any financial gains through that. Well, I, I mean, yeah. on to something, Alistair. We've done, like, 40 years of experimental neoliberalism. Now it's time for, like... <laughs> Dada neoliberalism, essentially, like a whole new movement. <laughs> I suppose just absurdist <laughs> neoliberalism. Let's do it. What always gets me about you know experiments like this, uh, you know, like Prospera does sort of the same thing, of course. But th- th- what's funny about it is you want to create these like insanely low regulated. There's no laws. There's like there's there's only Moloch or whatever, you know, and it, it's just pure capitalism, and that's the only thing that happens. Um, but they are also extant especially here in in the UK, within these zones where there are regulations. So, you know, the assumption is that the ongoing regulations, ongoing taxation, you know, stuff like roads outside of them will continue to exist for them whilst they get to opt out of them. Right. Yes. So, you know, that's one of the big problems that Prosper has is like they're they're far away from any of thing like this. So, you know, you can't physically get there a lot of the time because no one paved the goddamn road. Right. But here they're trying to get around that by saying, oh, yeah, well, we've got but we but we're going to use all of the right the stuff that comes from regulation and comes from having an actual government. But we're just going to accept this one area, which then surely will thrive. And it's it really kind of it's just also already like putting your finger on the kind of thumb of the scale. Right. Because it's it's not going to you know if this succeeds at all which it surely won't you know it's still relying on some form of regulated something i guess but yeah i mean it's it certainly like i mean what they're just doing is just like abusing any state resources that are left and you know like we've talked about with other industries in the last couple of i don't know maybe 20 podcasts it's just like you build an infrastructure you create a society and then you just give it away for free or with like many billions attached to the private sector and say have fun with it you're probably going to make it better um so that's probably what's going to happen here but i do briefly want to talk about paul romer again because i couldn't quite shoehorn it in uh, into this piece but i want to talk about it briefly anyway he wrote an article on cap x that like hideous mutant uh finance funded news web page uh, coming out of the London city where he proposed that because um, the UK has like these special visa for like people f- uh, who want to get out of Hong Kong now what he mm. said is what we should build it, what we should do is build a completely new city out of nowhere somewhere on the coast in of the UK and then we would put all the Hong Kong people there and because they are essentially magic capitalist dream pixies <laughs> if we put them all there they will just recreate a new Hong Kong in a- an area where nobody lives he drew a little map where, where like London is where people live, Manchester, and then like vast swathes of the coastline, which is like, yeah, nobody there. You can just go hog. Yeah, like the, the success of Hong Kong famously has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it's also like one of the most densely populated places on earth and there's just a whole ton of people to work. No, no. Mm-mm. No, or that it's like that. square bang on on some of the most important trade routes in the in known the... world, and like the gateway to China, essentially. Yeah, uh-huh. no, I, I, I think you guys are naysayers. I, for one, look forward to Hartley Pool Kong doing like gangbusters. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, in terms of lots to look forward to. Um, that's this is one of the ideas that's definitely. I, I I think this is one of those things that's I feel definitely like it's the only happen. idea, Rob. Really, at this point. Well, I mean, you say that, but the other thing that they've already done, I think last week while everybody was obsessed with something else, uh, was quietly lift some of the bans on fracking. So, you know, I get to be right. And I so love to be right because that's a prediction that I made. And, you know, I feel really good about being right. I, I feel good every time I hear about fracking, for sure. I mean, the, the, I mean, obviously, fracking in and of itself is bad and stupid and shouldn't be done anywhere but doing it in the fucking uk of all places like if you actually care about the actual science of uh, you know what what goes into deciding where you should if you are going to frack somewhere the uk is a terrible fucking cat the, the shale sands that they're looking at are fucking terrible like even in yeah. its, on its own terms but on the other hand, Alistair, have you considered that if three ports are let's sell the family silverware, fracking is for and strip the copper out the walls and sell that too, and it just logically has to happen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, they, they sort of tell themselves with the, what the magazine that's called CapEx. They never care about OPEX, do they? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, this, in a weird way, does provide uh, a bridge to our main topic for this evening. And we're going a little bit faster because we're doing this. And then I have a, we have a very delightful uh, article that I think Alan is going to enjoy very much as well. So that's why we're moving oh, swiftly yeah. onward. Um, mm. But we got all Alan on specifically um, because we're going to talk about some more worker action, which we yes. love to see. Hot worker um, action. Uh, so yeah, essentially, um, the UCU is currently balloting or like seventy thousand of its members across one hundred and fifty uh, universities, and um, at the same time, Unison uh, is also balloting a lot of its members, which are like the the staff of the university, so cleaners, administrators, caterers, security, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and they are essentially. The, both unions are striking over the same thing, uh, the same immediate cause, which is the uh, that the universities of the UK and the vice chancellors have offered a magnificent pay rise this year of three percent across the board for everybody, which is Can I just a say, real. We've had an American on. For some reason, it's made Rob more Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Eleanor, like, why why are you not satisfied with three percent? Don't you know the Queen is dead? I know, right? It's the, it's incredibly annoying, right? Because the, the fact that you get anything at all, everyone immediately says, oh, well, you know, you should just be happy. And it's like, well, no, because inflation is out of control, right? So, you know, the three, the, the demands for a 3% rise started like in 2019 or something like that. And yeah. inflation currently is 11.8%. <laughs> um, and so like that means that, you know, a 3% rise is, is a pay cut. Right. That's that's pay curve. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, between 2009 and 2019, like pay in higher education in general has fallen by about 17.6 percent. Right. Yeah. Like it's a, a lot, a lot. Um, and so now we think that like based on what they're offering, um, like what they're offering UCU and the most recent inflation data, it's about kind of it, it essentially is a it means that. On the whole, people are making about 25% less now than they did in the year of our Lord 2009. And um, worse <laughs> conditions, right? With the casualization and everything? Absolutely. So, you know, um, the university knows only how to uh, neoliberalize. Um, and, you know, like, thanks very much to the Lib Dems and everybody who uh, really, really sold us out on this one. Uh, but its answer to everything is just to make people uh, be on casual contracts um, and so you have people, you know, there's people like me. So, you know, at my institution, um, I've been working there since 2015 and I have to reapply for my job every year. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really want to like get get in like on into all these things because like um, I have notes. Um, mm -hmm, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I, I figure before we get into like some of the daily stuff, it's you know I'm not going to do like a big history thing because a lot of it is just a you know it's it's neoliberal li neoliberalism. But guess what it does. Um, mm. You know, but very, very, very briefly, essentially between 1998 and 2004, uh, it's a it's a Labour government under Tony Blair, of course, uh, the great hero that we are meant to model mm. everything on. Um, they introduced the means tested 3000 quid university fee as a way of the stated excuse is we want to keep funding for universities high so that they can attract all the talent and do the research and blah de blah de blah. Um, many universities <laughs> at that time were already like warning about like big funding shortfalls, uh, mm -hmm. essentially because the government had started cutting their budget. Um, yeah. And the universities themselves um, said thank you very much. Uh, and instead of offering you somewhere between a thousand to three thousand pretty much everybody said no now our tuition costs are three thousand mm -hmm. um this by the way is also around the time when a then little known uh, president of the Na national union of students a guy called west streeting starts supporting tuition fee hikes uh, <laughs> just you know as a little side note uh but then in 2010 Once a snake always a fucking snake huh <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but then in 2010, Eleanor, as you were saying, uh, this is under the Lib Dems and the Tories in coalition. Uh, this is under Vince Cable. The fees go to 9,000, um, you know, with a variable. It doesn't mean that all universities have to do it. Guess what? They all do. Uh, but this is, again, under the motto um, of the universities are not on a solid financial footing. Therefore, we need to uh, just... 
up the tuition fees because if we up the tuition fees then then there will be more academic staff this, this, this everything will be will be better essentially uh, so of course that's what happened and that's why we're not talking about problems in the university sector today but on a very different topic um, there's one more important thing that happens around this time and essentially during the coalition years is the coalition lifts the cap on the total number of students for per course and per university uh, so this is all meant to like turn universities into like more of a free-for-all market where they are supposed to compete with each other for every student for nine thousand pounds um and you know competition would create better universities so there's like essentially ever more students but universities cannot or will not hire more staff cannot because you need phd experts most of the time and mm -hmm. not all courses have that many available at any given time and they will not hire more staff is because that you know if you just put more students per professor or per instructor that means higher rates of profit this of course has led to massive increases both in terms of the workload for um teachers and academics but also in terms of the support staff the the admin people the security people everybody and also it leads to much worse educational outcomes for uh the students themselves because you don't get the attention you might need or want um mm. eleanor i don't know if you were already teaching in the i think you were already here in the uk like teaching and in being being an academic <sighs> yeah, essentially i was here so when when the uh when the the cap went up in um 2010 i was just about to start my PhD. Um, luckily for me, I was still getting, they had like a rule where if you were already starting, like they couldn't charge you the, the nine grand or whatever. So I, like, I was still paying like three or something. Um, but uh, I didn't start teaching until, I guess, when did I start teaching? The year of our Lord 2013. I believe so. It was not long after that. Yeah. And um, I have to say, you know, in terms of um, class sizes and everything, you know, it's been it's been getting much, much worse. And especially like post pandemic, that's a big thing as well. Yeah. Is that because everything just moved online and you're just supposed to like be able to zoom with 200 students now or? Yeah. And basically what a part of it is, is, you know, lifting the cap. So what that has essentially done too is it's been really disastrous for what we call the post 92s. So what used to be a formerly, um, you know, kind of trade schools or technical uh, schools like polytechnics, a lot of those got turned into universities. Um, in, in 1992. Um, and they often, you know, basically, it doesn't matter where you go in the entire world right now, um, it, to any university that you go to, it will be crammed to the rafters full of absolutely excellent staff. Um, because there are so many uh, incredibly skilled and trained people out there that you can get them in and pay them no money and treat them like shit and they'll still show up and, and teach you really well. But there is still low status that is afforded to these places. So we've had uh, massive problems, for example, here um, in London with uh, goldsmiths essentially just trying to axe entire departments. Um, similarly, at Roehampton, they've axed entire departments and um, things of that nature. And part of the reason that that's happened is because when the more prestigious quote unquote schools don't have a cap anymore for students, then they can just say, oh, well, we're, we're having like 200 students in this class now. Fuck it. Like go all the way. And so if Oxford and Cambridge can hoover up as many students as they possibly want and can cram to the rafters, if, you know, the University of London schools like um, UCL or LSE are like slamming all these kids in, then suddenly the smaller institutions don't have the students that are in who are paying the bills and keeping the lights on. Because what it's come down to is that the, the way that these budgets have worked, now suddenly people are dependent on the students in order to keep the university funding going, although that's completely made up the universities could keep running without it that's that's bullshit uh, but it disadvantages um the the post 92s in particular yeah i mean and you say all this eleanor but i have it on good word that the business schools are all doing pretty well oh well so that's fine then <laughs> oh yeah no <laughs> Um, yeah, so like essentially, so what you, you what you get and what, what is the situation we have now is that like because of the tuition fees that have gone up and we have like also sort of a societal expectation that was definitely like boosted on their Blair, but that persists today is that like everybody must at all times go to university mm -hmm. because otherwise you will you will not have a have a good career. Um, so one of the outcomes has been at least for students is that the average student debt for those who started last year, so in twenty one twenty two, uh, is 
projected to be 45,800 pounds and oh. only 20% of them are expected to pay the whole thing back. So as you say, Eleanor, like when the universities say, well, we need these people um, to pay the bills. Well, no, because all you're doing, all the government is doing is giving debt to students and then the students yep. give that debt to the university. So they're only putting in a middleman to fuck the middleman so that there's like a, a, a debt peon for them to extract out of and then sell on to the private sector. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like a lot of that obfuscation we talked about with um, other forms of neoliberalized public services like mm. um, buses and uh, the water supply and all that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what, really what what is kind of happening here to, you know, not to get all class war about it, but I'm going to get all class war about it. No, no, is, go oh, ahead. Please, <laughs> please do. <laughs> part of what kind of happened with, um, you know, the push to getting more students into school is people found out that poor kids were smart. And it turns out that, like, university oh, wasn't God. something that only rich kids could do, right? And which is not what they wanted to hear. Um, and so there had to be some sort of way of saddling people who have the university attainments, who have, you know, all of the marks and, and have done all of the things with some form of something that's going to keep them from, you know, becoming members of the bourgeoisie, right? And that is mm. debt. Um, so you now go to university and you can have all of the educational things that you want, but it doesn't matter because if you're paying back, you know, 45 grand worth of loans uh, or not, as the case may be, it, it doesn't matter because, you know, you'll still retain your servile status and, and you're not going to like rise up to threaten the status quo in any meaningful way. And you won't, you know, be able to attain your ranks in particular places. So, you know, for example, this is a real safe way of keeping the journalistic class in this country safe. Right. Because uh, journalism mm. is, um, you know, a high status but low paying career. It's the same thing with academia. Yeah. This keeps poor people out of academia. Yeah. Um, so any of the things that rich people still want to do um, where, you know, their mummy and daddy can continue to pay that rich people can still s maintain the kind of a grip on that whilst keeping um, individuals from the working class out of it. Uh, because if you've got a bunch of debt, you simply can't, you know, labor in obscurity for years. Um and yeah. you will just have to wander off and find an office job, you know? If there's one thing I have learned, it's that all journalists should know a degree of fear. <laughs> and I think that's all we need to learn. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, not to like get all, all, all Brexit or Romania on anything, but like another factor that has definitely contributed to the problems currently financially that universities have, certainly in terms of research, is like Brexit has cut off like a huge amount of European research funding that mm -hmm. a lot of current projects and future projects were very dependent on because like long term like fundamental research the UK university the UK government is not interested in sponsoring but the EU still had some of that essentially so that's like cut another leg out from Certainly for academics who are not who are less reliant on um, teaching salaries, but more on research grants for them. This is like a very existential problem that has not been resolved and probably will not be resolved. Uh, mm -hmm. But and mm -hmm. also all of these things will in the end, of course, contribute to uh, like a real downturn in in university attendance and quality yep. and also how they are perceived. Absolutely. Um, and it's a, a real a thing that's a bit frustrating because, you know, Britain doesn't make anything anymore. I don't know that you guys know this um, with the occasion of like five trains in Derby. But one of the things that the UK did extraordinarily well. We make the well, Ajax. We make yeah. the Ajax, Eleanor. True. I don't know, Rob. One day we will make the Ajax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we had a really excellent uh, university system. And it is one of the things that we do is we, we produce um, really well-educated people. And we had that going for us. And uh, Brexit really, really compromised that. You know, and I don't want, I don't, you know. I, I yeah, don't we don't have to much. get back into this, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's it, it, you can't say that it didn't affect things because it certainly did. You know, you can't apply for the same forms of funding. It's harder to move staff back and forth, uh, things of this nature. So yeah, it, it, it's been a real problem. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to, to talk about, certainly in terms of academic staff, and Eleanor, I know you also wanted to talk about, I don't want to call them support staff, but like uh, uh, other staff, like we security. We call them professional um, services. In, professional in, in services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so I want, to, I, I want to give you like definitely enough room to talk about that too, but I want to talk about like what it's been like for um, academic staff, non-tenured uh, academic staff. And, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think maybe... 
do you just like want to talk about because I know you mentioned at the top that you like you have one year contracts and I, I was yeah. wondering if you just wanted to talk a little bit about like what it's like for you to have that kind of insecurity in your daily life in your professional life yeah it's it's a really difficult one because you know this is this has been instrumental into you know in some ways me pursuing um, public history more as um, a, a career than academics because fundamentally you know I think of, of everyone that I know so you know I'm talking everybody everyone so say from my PhD cohort so you know maybe like plus three minus three years um, I have three friends that I know who have permanent jobs um, Jesus fuck yeah and you know absolutely brilliant people um and uh, you, and and this is the thing is it, and those people are all brilliant of course but you know we all are right so um you know i've, I've had friends who've left for all number of reasons for other careers uh, things of this nature but it's because it does your head in and you're never ever ever able to plan you know so um a friend of mine shout out mark uh who's probably not listening to this but he's um he was doing really well you know and and this is the thing doing really well will be like oh, you got a three-year contract and then you got another three-year contract and then you got a two-year contract and then you got a one-year contract. But he's a dad now. Like, he's about to be a dad. And he can't, like, keep applying for something. You know, if it's, you know, you if you're, you're, you have to move your whole life every three years, every two years, which is what a lot of this, you know, predicates. How can you do that? Like, people can't do that. It means that you can't have a family. Um, yeah. You can't yeah. ever have... Um, you know, and this is probably a good thing, but, you know, like, it's almost impossible for academics to be in relationships with other academics, you know, because you'll end up having to go to other places. Um, one of my best friends, uh, shout out to Claire, she's recently got a tenure track position, so she's moved to America. But um, my girl went from, she got a postdoc at Cambridge, so, like, very well done. That was a good, that, good job. Then she got another one in Germany, so she did that. Then she moved to Astana, Kazakhstan for seven years. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was actually, as things go, like, sure, she was in Kazakhstan, but it was permanent. Um, they give you a place to live. They were paying her out the nose. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would be precluded, like, from that. So, for example, if, say she was queer, like, you can't bring your partner mm. to Kazakhstan. Um, and now she has ended up uh, in Indiana um, at the, I don't know, Ilan, I, I don't know if it's Indiana University or University of Indiana. Sorry, I'm not going to learn. Um, but <laughs> you're you know, a terrible American. I know. Fuck it. Maybe, maybe I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I ain't learned about the Midwest. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> such, oh, just wait till Nate hears that. Yeah, that's that's right, Nate. I said it to you. Uh, I literally <laughs> went to Nate uh, while she was applying. Was like, Nate, is Bloomington good to live in? He's like, that's the best place in Indiana to live in. And I was like, okay. Uh, but um, <laughs> so. Um, within this, you know, she's had this huge amount of upheaval and, you know, most people can't, can't do that. You know, you can't, you can't yeah. just move around like that. And, you know, for me, this kind of like year on year, oh, well, you know, wish a prayer. Oh, I'll, I'll try for this. Oh, here's another three years. Here's another two years. I can't live like that. Right. So I, I keep teaching on this course that I've been teaching for a while, even though I have to, to redo it every year. Um, which is also built around me. Like, it's built around me. I give several of the lectures. They're just assuming that I'm going to be there all the time, but they won't give me a permanent... It's 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 very, very frustrating. Um, and, you know, ironically, like, doing freelance work is um, more stable and reliable for me. Um, well, I mean, you're, you're, insane. You're, you're a star of the big screen now, so, you know, for yeah, you, honestly. life is just very different <laughs> the, these and, days. Yeah, exactly. And the silver microphone as well, don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, well, and, I mean, and, and this is like one of these things where I also feel bad because, you know, I, I kind of at times, rightly or wrongly, get held up as, you know, in you know, as a paragon of what we call alt act. So it's something that you can do when you have a PhD afterwards. And I'm, and people will be like, Oh, what are your tips? And I'm like, baby, I can't tell you how to do this. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, um, have you tried? Like, and it's like, what, what do I tell people? Um, go back and yeah, time. Into a microphone. Yeah. Like start a blog eight years ago. Uh, yeah. cultivate I mean, an can... audience there and then start yelling into a microphone all the time. Like you better be charming, you know, which, <laughs> and it's like, yeah. um, I, I, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think even we on this podcast can seriously say to anybody as careers advice is, have you thought about being online more? Like, yeah. that's just... <laughs> can I get a Rob noise, David? 
no, no, no. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's and literally, you know, be more online is actually a lot of the times bad, you know, advice. So, and, and this is how desperate it is. is Can people, confirm. You know, like people yeah. are looking at the, the girl who made booty shorts and being like, how'd you get your job? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, listen, never skip your squats, okay? <laughs> That's how. That's how you do it. Yeah. Right? I'm- I know, like I know, like three, uh, p- three people who used to work in academia, and all of them, like all PhDs, all like phenomenally good at what they do, mm. and all of them have gone like, nope, time to leave, uh, leave that because I want to do literally anything with my life other than academia, yeah, and, yeah. You know, start a family, actually move somewhere permanent, whatever, and yeah, they're all moving into the private sector now. So, and you know. You can't fault them for doing that when they've got all these mm. skills and stuff and are mm. going to get paid out of fucking nose, most of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, I've got I friends mean, who, who've done all manner of things. So, like, I've got friends who, like, became barristers instead, you know, because they <laughs> were so incredibly smart that they were just like, well, I guess I'll just go be a barrister. Oh, I'm a barrister. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and just, like, th- this is the sort of caliber of people that we're, we're talking about. And um, every day they are, you know, chewed up, spat out, and instead, like, whoever has the most, like, funding from their family and gets to hang in by their fingernails keeps going you know yeah. i mean it's almost like the it's almost like the amazon model of employee retention but with a phd on top of it mm-hmm. yeah it's like i mean and, i was the, oh, sorry like the trouble is too even when you when you leave uh one of the issues is that it's also really hard uh, for people who are leaving academia to get jobs because nobody understands that academia is completely fucked up and that you'll never get a job and they're like mm, i don't want to hire you because you're just gonna leave for a job in academia <laughs> 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 it's like those don't exist there are no jobs you know so it's yeah. like it, it's quite I, funny I was, being- I was- I was reading some reporting from the UCU um, that they've done on this, and essentially, like more than seven, according to UCU research, like more than seventy percent of researchers and academic teachers are stuck on insecure, like year-long, two-year-long, three-year-long stuff that we've been mm-hmm. talking about. So this is like about ninety thousand academic staff members are, yep. are and union members are on like these short-term insecure insecure contracts and apart from like the impact on your personal life which is obviously horrendous is it will also but but like more by the back door uh, impact your academic freedom to write and say what you think because if mm-hmm. you know that your contract's going to come up for review in the ne- you know in the next six months and you know that like your university has just signed a major like sponsorship deal with uh, BP or something or Shell, are you really going to write, you know, a substantive piece about the petrochemical industry uh, it, yeah. at, it, at the university? So, like, it's also dangerous in terms of, of academic freedom, because if you're financially not free, you are not free to say what you think. Of course. Was there not a whole thing a couple of days, maybe a week or two ago, I, time has no fucking meaning in the post-funeral atmosphere, but um, well, <laughs> like fucking Jeff Bezos literally added someone for yeah, they were talking yeah. shit about him. Like, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure she lost her job off the back of that as well. Yeah, she, she yeah. was. She and like, um, he was adding people who were talking about how they weren't going to, how they don't like the royals, and and was saying like <laughs> this was unkind and like you know the the university. I think this this was over in the states, but like the university didn't mm. fire her, but it basically said, oh, well, she shouldn't have done that. The, the, everyone's magic blood grandma is dead and it's and, 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 and it was like ridiculous so we all had to like yep. go do a big open letter where, where we were like what the fuck are you doing Carnegie Mellon and, and it, yeah it, it's ridiculous it was ridiculous Bezos just got a glimpse of what, what people are going to say about him when he dies yeah that's basically it <laughs> and it's like it, honey it ain't gonna be so much worse because nobody thinks you're their granddad so mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah you haven't spent the last 70 years running your own PR campaign to make sure that everybody loves you yeah. yeah, he's not Elon Musk. I mean, essentially, but there is an even worse situation in terms of academia, because like, especially a big chunk of teaching like the, the, the first and second years is done, essentially now done by zero hours workers, which are generously mm. called atypical academics. Uh, and about oh. 20% of all universities use zero hour contractors in teaching. Um, and mo- and weirdly enough, like 50% of those atypical academics are employed at the Russell Group universities. So like the most elite yeah. Oxford, Cambridge, like that that bunch, those use the most zero hour contracts, even those, though, though those are also by far the best funded, best endowed universities uh, in the country. 
Oh man, the Russell Group. So sorry, little rant here. The Russell Group University thing is total horse shit. I know. Right? Mm-hmm. The Russell Group is basically a bunch of u- universities that are kind of also um, kind of looking to you know uh, Cambridge and Oxford and going, can we ride on your coattails, please? And I don't know what bungs they did to arrange it, but you've got like fucking Glasgow University in amongst <laughs> that lot. Mm. And yeah, like David, David's reaction, I should tell you everything. I went to Glasgow. Glasgow is nowhere near on the same level as Oxford and Cambridge, but it's a Russell Group University just because it's old. It's absolute horseshit. Mm. <laughs> anyway, rant over. Sorry. No, nah, that's right. Um, but yeah, Eleanor, I don't know if, if, I mean, you, you know, you, of course, you, you talked about like having, you know, your own sort of blog, pod, media, whatever thing mm-hmm. you got going on, but like, uh, not to denigrate it, but I don't know how to describe it at the moment. Um, <laughs> is, yeah. um, Me either. That, that, <laughs> It's like, like that so many university staff right now, especially those on these insecure contracts, they don't mm-hmm. have like one job. They have two or sometimes even yeah. three. And one of them can is like genuinely is like being a barista or working in a restaurant or something just to, to keep the lights on, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Because the majority of the uh, a lot of these contracts, I, I won't say majority because I don't know what the actual numbers are, but a lot of these contracts are zero hours. Right. So, hmm. um, for example, the one that I'm talking about is a zero that, that I work is a zero hours contract. Contract. So I'm paid for um, a an hour of um, you know office hour every week, um, prep for the class, teaching for the class, and marking for the class, um, mm. and that's it. And I don't get paid for summers, um, and I don't get paid like over Christmas break. Um, I used to have a real problem with them just fully shutting down my email account every summer. What? <laughs> uh, yeah, like where where it would just like shut down, and I'd have to get it like turned back on. Um, in the autumn, but I complained enough that they've they've stopped doing it now. So like, shout out <laughs> to, to that no longer <laughs> happening to me. The system works. Yeah, but but it's it's super super common for people who are on these to have, be teaching at three, four, or five universities and kind of be zooming all over the place. And I used to do that. Um, so there was one year where I was teaching uh, simultaneously at uh, UCL, Kings, and uh, Queen Mary and LSE. So, um, you know, and I, I would teach sort of like a class at all of them. And Jesus, moving. and I'm assuming... <laughs> yeah. And I'm assuming they didn't pay you for like your, your like hours upon hours of sitting in the tube and like bouncing between one university and another. And oh, just, God, like- no. God, no. And, it, you know, even it, with certain ones, like I, I stopped going to... I, I stopped doing it. So, for example, at King's, when I was teaching at King's, um, we were getting paid the equivalent. We kind of broke it down in terms of like marking um, student essays. It was sort of like you had about 10 minutes to mark um, every essay that was given to you or you were losing money. Jesus um, Christ. Yeah. And it was it was like 10 minutes, 10 minutes fully. Um, and uh, so it was just with like what the piles of marking are. And how can you ever in, in even for first years with 2000 words, how can you in 10 minutes do anything substantive? So you end up, you know, basically stealing from yourself because you end up wanting to do a good job. You don't want to screw the kids over. Um, but when it breaks down, when you actually look at the time that you spend on when you're having to do this much marking, when you're having to do this much class prep, when you're running around, you end up making less than minimum wage. In, yeah. in order mm. to, to do this, because it, it just yeah. simply doesn't come out well. And I've been in, in meetings like, because um, I, I simultaneously, you know, one of the things that I do is I do university admin um, in order to pay the bills. And uh, for a while, they were kind of like grooming me uh, to, to see if I could like be in the in the big leagues and, you know, with the CEOs and everything. And that didn't work out well, because I kept telling them things like uh, we, they had a big meeting where they're like, oh, look, the Divinity School introduced this marking rubric and things went, you know, the, the marking stuff got more like when and I was like, yeah, or you could just pay the, your staff. You could pay your staff. And they were really mad at me for saying in the middle of the meeting <laughs> that it's like, well, you, you have a bunch of like massively underpaid staff. And the reason that the, the marking isn't good is because you're asked you were giving them 10 minutes to mark things. So why don't you just pay them a reasonable amount? And it was like, no. So anyway, it was curtains for me from there on. But uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> they, they, they literally don't want to hear it. They cannot hear it. You know, and these are people who are on, you know, fabulously well paid you know, positions that are permanent, you know, the ones who, who pull the strings. So oh, for, paid by the same students, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's a sort of like another topic I wanted to, to get in on as well, because like as I was doing the research of this, I'm like, so the students are per head spending more and more money and going into more and more debt. The, mm-hmm. the academics, broadly speaking, are working harder and earning less and more insecure than ever before. 
So somewhere in this system, there is a lot of money, but where the fuck is it going? And like, much like yeah. any marketized system, uh, it goes to two things, essentially. It goes to the top, where it is leached out, and it mm -hmm. goes essentially mm -hmm. to its own perpetuation, like for yes. the machine to keep extracting uh, wealth, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I mean, you know you know how, Rob, I, I cracked that joke earlier about the business schools are doing well. Like, <laughs> there's a reason for that. Well, yeah, yeah. but I, th I uh, briefly on the business schools, because my partner um, has uh, an MBA and like she paid a phenomenal amount of money for that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go mm -hmm. into how much that was. But I think part of the reason is, is also where we started is like because everybody now has a bachelor's or and more yeah. and more people have MAs. Like if you want to distinguish yourself for like higher levels of jobs you need like an extra academic badge and that's now the mba and like that's why there's more and more and more mba programs because you need more uh you know you need more people to distinguish themselves further because everybody's got a, de a degree now so that's no, no longer good enough mm, yeah exactly I and mean, you need now you know the ma or the ma from a, a highly you know established place in order to, to distinguish you um, in just a world of, you know, BAs. And so it's just, that's the first cut that jobs make. And it's just like, okay, well, only look at whoever has masters, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, so, so like that's part of it. But I think mainly because of the marketization and, uh, of universities and the university system, one of the things that's become really important to all universities is the, the league tables. So mm -hmm. just like the general rankings that most yeah, big UK papers yeah. put out every year. And so much money, as far as I can make out, goes into like advertising, management, consulting for like the university courses to be jacked in the right rankings in the right place so they can attract the students. I don't know, Eleanor, what your experience with like the league tables is. Oh, yeah. The, the league tables are really funny because um, it... it because there are multiple league tables, right? And I, I think that there was one there was one provost at UCL when I was doing my uh, PhD there who used to actually, to his credit, send quite funny, you know, like his newsletters or whatever were quite funny. And he was like, as you know, it's the UCL policy um, to only uh, talk about league tables if they put us in the top 10. And like that yeah. was basically, and, and, it, and it's true, right? Because there are enough of them that you can sort of... Uh, you could sort of uh, game it. And a big part of where that money goes to in terms of courting those is buildings. It's yeah. buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're just building stuff all the time, uh, which has uh, started being quite funny now in kind of like a post-COVID world as well, because, uh, you know, you don't actually need to have, for example, professional services staff around very, very much because a lot of things can be done online, but there's all these empty buildings. So there's, there's this real uh, tension at the moment in universities where some of them are really trying to force staff back in because they have to justify what what are you doing with all those buildings yeah i mean that's that's really been sort of like a like a vanity arms race that everybody has to have like the shiniest facilities and mm -hmm. you know the the most beautiful buildings and partly it's also like it's also we're talking about student housing as well so like it's just literally the university is is turning itself into a financial engine that is like not in part organized around being a land around being a landlord uh, mm -hmm, you know, and then mm -hmm. the rates for those have gone up for like student housing have gone up incredibly in 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 the last uh, decade. Like yeah, I think like, almost, yeah, almost I like mean, forty percent or something. I was going to say like every time I drive through Newcastle, there's more student like flats up, and they're always mm -hmm. the ugliest fucking buildings as well. You can tell immediately like oh that'll be student mm -hmm. housing because it's like orange and blue or some shit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, concrete cube and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but with like some fucking panels on it to make it look more colorful. flammable oh sorry yeah, more <laughs> flammable as well mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's like well, it's a surprise surprise you know in the neo the neoliberal university a landlord it's more likely than you'd think you know like it's <laughs> the, the only answer that we have to anything even even in the uk universities can only be dream of becoming landlords that's it that's the only dream available i don't know you were saying that the uk doesn't make anything these days but it does it makes landlords it does make landlords yeah you got me there definitely on the subject of academic landlordism i'm gonna do a shout out for friends of the pod well there's your problem they did an episode specifically on the universities that they attended and their landlord tendencies so if you want to hear more about this in the united states go check them out it's quite informative mm. yeah but don't give them any money they'll give the money to us yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs>
So, like, um, according to the UCU, uh, most overall universities in the UK have budgeted uh, for for 2023, I think, something like 4.6 billion for new, like, CapEx building projects. And Mm -hmm. that's, like, 30% more than last year. So, last year, they spent, like, I don't know, uh, somewhere north of 2.5 billion on buildings as well. So, sorry, 3 billion uh, as well. So, like... In terms of there is money in this university system, it's just going into shiny properties rather than like either giving students a financial break so they can study and actually, you know, make and enjoy that experience rather than living in the fear of debt or paying the academics or paying the professional services that make the whole thing go. So Mm -hmm, and the other mm -hmm. thing they're they're doing um, a lot, which is uh, in going abroad because UK universities still have a very good name. And if you open like a satellite campus in Dubai, let's say, uh, Mm -hmm. you can charge all the students there like full whack. So they pay like 24, 25K a year. And in that way, like you can just generate more money and coast on the reputation uh, that you have. But that that doesn't always like like go very well. Uh, This is from The Guardian. Um, UCU argued that some universities waste money on expensive overseas campuses. In February, it was revealed that just 100 students students graduated from the New York campus of Glasgow Caledonia University <laughs> since it opened in 2014, despite receiving Wait, 21, what? yeah, 21.5 <laughs> million okay, in so- loans <laughs> to keep the campus open. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, for once, Rob, I'm not going to have a go at you over your mispronunciation of Glasgow Caledonia, but I am going to ask, right, you're telling me that Glasgow Caledonia, Cali, mm-hmm. have a fucking satellite campus in, in New, New York, York City, yes. Absolutely, Amazing. absolutely fundamental that they do, you know, like this is definitely not a waste of money, you know, and it's just, it's such a, you know, it's just such a well-known uni. Uh, they were just crying <laughs> out for it in New York. Mm. You know, f- famously, is- there weren't any other universities in New York City. <laughs> do, they, do they ship the buck fast and tracks it's in? Like, what, how... <laughs> Oh, God, it's It's just crazy. Yeah, so it's and and you see this all the time, like, you know, there'll be Dubai campuses, like Qatari campuses, you know, campuses all over the place like that. And you're always kind of like, huh, when you see them. Um, And obviously it takes way, way more money to kind of get those projects off the ground and to get things like that aloft. And it, it simply doesn't bring people in because you know yeah sure students may want a name like pr- they probably don't want cali like sorry sorry cali like i'm not trying to denigrate again it's probably a good school i don't know but it's not but Cali. yeah it's it, but, but whatever right like when they want these titles you know the titles they want are oxbridge or lse or or something of that nature it's not going to be the 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 little the little guys, you know, so like maybe you could get away with UCL sort of, but then again, the sort of people who have the kind of money to pay for this, you know, in Dubai or Qatar, they've also got the money to come out here, right? Yeah. Like, and we increasingly have lots and lots of um, overseas students, which um, I am not down on. A lot of people get the thingy and and quite xenophobic about it. Um, And I think it's, it's, you know, totally fine provided that students here can also go to school without dying um, which is the problem that we're sort of having right like it's the it's trying to kind of um, balance one with the other i mean I, you know you get that kind of xenophobia about it i remember even when i was i, I was at university the kind of you know wave of chinese students was like a thing mm. that was noticeable on campus mm-hmm. and like most of it was fine the problem was you'd get and you know i'm just being really candid about this you'd get people who were over and very clearly they paid a lot of money to be let in but they didn't meet like yeah. in theory you're meant to be able to speak yeah. english and all the rest of it yeah but in practice no they absolutely didn't and i know because i tutored one of them in how you know basic english because they were really struggling mm, mm. Yeah. so it's like you know what what can you really do about that that is the profit motive is putting someone who isn't really able and and the thing about them is they were getting passed too mm, even with mm-hmm. content that shouldn't have passed yeah and, um and i mean i've, I've seen that happen at, at all sorts of levels like there were there was really big pressure on us um it, at certain universities that i had where we would have um a lot we'd have a lot of american exchange students and you were not mm. allowed to fail the american exchange students <laughs> you just yeah. weren't yeah yeah I mean, I'm going to say I'm going to say James's experience with the uh, the Chinese students is fine because they let me into university and I barely speak English. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, briefly going back to the the foreign campus thing, um, I've j- I just thought I'd check the fucking university of Paisley, or as it's now known, the University of the West of Scotland, because I thought it'd be really yeah. funny if they had a foreign one. 
their best attempt so far has been a London campus. <laughs> oh, God bless them. <laughs> They're trying. I was thinking about this actually. You know what? Glasgow Caledonian opening a university in the United States is actually genius because a lot of Midwesterners will think, oh, Caledonian University, and like they'll hear the bagpipes in their head, like oh, that God, you know, thing yeah. on Castle, and they'll just be like, yeah, no, that sounds fun- amazing. Um, so, you know what? That's, that's, making the, that's making the best of what you got, Glasgow Cali. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying I mean, to picture like a campus of like Northumbria University in the middle of New York. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not got it's not got the cachet it's not got the, the cachet over by um justin's house uh, like shout out uh shout out to my long-suffering boyfriend uh there's a campus of uh the university of chicago which always makes me laugh in london so it's like and it's specifically the university of Col- of chicago business school has a london oh, campus wow. oh that's a uh, like yeah. a little dependency of chicago boys right there in the yeah. heart of london that's really uh-huh. nice <laughs> yeah yeah when you say it's when you say it's a chicago business school i'm imagining guys in like pinstripe suits with machine Machine guns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, th- those are like the benign Chicago business guys in comparison to the Chicago school of yeah, business. It's, like, it's, it's, that, that's, that's you'd rather the issue, have the yeah. pinstripe machine gun guys by, like, by a the long margin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you need to. I, I understand you need a minor in like Chilean geography to be able to graduate, and strangely, battle tactics too, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jamie, were you saying that you wanted the uh, Northumbria, New York uh, campus just so you can recreate that scene from uh, Castle? Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Teach them how to finally dunch a gadget. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like speaking about like gangsters in pinstripe suits, like the the the, the other people that are doing very well are this whole system. Uh, Eleanor, you already like mentioned it briefly. Is essentially like upper management. Oh um, God, yeah. <laughs> Because, like, the, of course, when something is marketized and, and it doesn't seem to work properly, the thing you do is add in more management layers and pay them better uh, because that always leads to better outcomes. That's what we've seen in, like, all the other privatized industries we've talked about. Um, as of this year, like, vice chancellors in ge- overall are at, like, about £270,000 a year. But that's, like, the average. There are those that are way, way above two two hundred seventy k a year. Um, yeah. And technically, like the the regulator, the Office for Students can intervene intervene and cut these salaries, but you know they're not going to fucking do that. <laughs> Certainly not on the yeah, majority. Right. Yeah, and it, like there's all kinds of wild things that happens because it, th- these people are just kind of business people. They're not really necessarily brought in from any kind of uh, university. I, I dispute that because they're not people. Well, yeah, they're they're hardly <laughs> people. Uh, but uh, they they there will be all kinds of wild things where all this money got spent. For example, um, for someone got brought over, I think from Hong Kong or something. Well, I, I can't remember exactly where they got brought over. Um, and sort of like fifty grand was spent bringing their cats over. <laughs> where they were like oh yeah you'll you'll have to you'll have to like um spend money and it's like oh yeah absolutely there you go and it's it, so it, it's like it's beyond just also you know they're getting ridiculous amounts of money for doing nothing uh but they also just get all these strange perks that obviously none of us get but they they're hmm. allowed to kind of help themselves to and um it gets like incredibly wild. Like, well, they'll, they'll they'll expense all kinds of things. So it's like very famously there was kind of like a bunch of expenses that went that went through. And someone like expensed a bunch of booze on a night out, and there was like all these porn star martinis. And that's kind of like one of the <laughs> one of the famous uh, cases. But they so so it's very much like they are like living it up. You know, they are. And it'll be like schools that you don't that you haven't even heard of. Too. It'll be kind of like. Um, I think it's like a Bath University. They they had a bunch of issues with kind of like yeah the yeah, yeah Bath there. is fame yeah yeah they had yeah. like a hugely expensive vice chancellor. One of the, the perks they often seem to get is because like the vice chancellor very often also needs to move for their work, but like the university will pick up the tab and like either rent a gigantic house or like have a house available for them in like yeah. stark mm-hmm. contrast to like the staff and the academics. Yeah, so at, at King's, I forget what it is, but like the principal or like one of the people, like one of the chancellors, uh, they get given this huge fancy apartment that's on top of the Mom Library, which is kind of like a neo-Gothic building on uh, Chancery Lane. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So they get paid like they get paid half a mil or or something like that, and then it's and also here's your free house in the middle of London. So that's cool. Incredible. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Would you would you accept a three percent pay rise if it came with fifty grand's worth of cats, though? Oh, yeah. I mean, probably could, because that would be more than doubling my salary. So yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs>
The market for pedigree cats in the UK is going to collapse if we do that, though, Jamie. Like, no, no, hold on, hold on. Hold on. There's a trick here. Does it have to be multiple cats, or can you roll it all into one big cat? Can I just spend it on cabbage and let her live the life of her dreams? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> she deserves it. She's worth it. I'm telling you. Social services, because I know we haven't yeah. really talked about it yeah. that much. And before so, like, yeah, we start... Basically, the same issues that are happening with, um, you know, with, with the academics are also kind of being replicated at the professional services level. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, there, again, there's like tons of money for like middle management or chancellors and things like that. We need HR people. Right. We need or the librarians are, are treated extremely shabbily where it's like, um, you know, they'll have to work on sociable hours. They have to work all kinds of, you know, weekends and here, there and everywhere. And that's a real problem for them. We just have a shortage of the staff who actually do the work. And we have the same kind of issue that basically any industry has with its professional services, where it's like, um, you know, they're, they'll kind of be like, well, a wizard will fix it. Um, and there's just kind of like layers upon layers upon layers of bureaucracy. Um, it's very, very difficult to get anything done. And it's because, you know, we need more people who are kind of be, being hired at, like, it's, it's in a band system in the same no, way that Lena, the no, NHS Lena, is. We've created an app for the app for the library and that should solve all of the problems yeah basically the app, like, the app has cost us two million pounds like one of the places that um, I do admin for um, at the moment they just spent all this money on this fancy new HR system it don't work mm -hmm. Like, it just doesn't, you have to do everything twice. So it's like, you have to basically use the old system, which is like, put everything down on paper. And then like, and then it used to be, you put everything down on paper and handed it to an HR person. Now you've got to put everything down on paper, look at it and enter it into an HR system. And then like the, and in theory, in theory, then like the HR person looks at it. Everything takes twice as long now. Right. And they're kind of like, well, we'll, we'll get a, we'll get I, an IT solution to this. And it's like, are you going to stop? No, no, no. It's like, and then like the solutions never work. They always spend tons on it. I mean, it, it, and it's things like that. Or the cleaners um, get treated really, really abysmally. And this is a huge, mm -hmm. a big problem that we have, particularly where cleaners, for example, will be on um, outsourced contracts. They're not even employed by the university. They'll be employed by mm -hmm. like, you know, some abysmal cleaning service, they'll be expected to be there, you know, essentially 12 hours a day, they don't get paid for it. So we've had to fight really hard just to get cleaners brought in house a lot of the time, and be actually d employed directly by universities. Um, so there's a huge problem with that. And um, the university services um, at a couple of my unis, uh, including Kings, we're going on strike next week. So we are out on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week yeah yeah as long as another monarch doesn't die i know right because it would be, yeah. be disrespectful to the queen to well uh, there's the universities with king in the name so basically yeah. you can't strike exactly that's that's how it works that's how it works so yeah it's um so basically everything that's kind of you see, that you see for academics is kind of replicated at the professional services level you see fewer short-term contracts but it also depends on what you're actually talking about because uh, so for example my partner Blair he does um, medical research so he's a he's a clinical trial uh, manager and he just basically gets moved from trial to trial or has to move from place to place depending on if they have brought in money for a grant to run a trial um, mm. so he kind of bounces around between universities depending on where the money is because they don't just have a bunch of people who work there or you know he gets it, he has real problems because, um, you know, universities, for example, will treat the clinical trial stuff as though it is a um, it's a way to make money. So they're bidding alongside, for example, the NHS for particularized medical trials. And they'll be like, no, 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 we can we like, oh, you'll give us money. Yeah, bring that in. And then they will just work their clinical trials people like 12 hours a day and put them on like two or three trials in order to get that grant funding through. So the grant funding comes in and they go, yeah, we can do that. We can do that well, when they don't have capacity. They don't have enough staff to do it. And they just like depend on working their staff into the absolute ground and killing them because they want to keep the extra money from the grants. And that's how they bring money. in. So hmm. it's it's so and these are professional services people. It's not academics, but it's the same thing. It's just abusive staff ways of bringing money in in order to kind of like pay off uh, buildings and things like that. And that often gets overlooked because we tend to focus on academics. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, but there's all sorts of people that make a university run 
And if you can't treat like your clinical trials people well, who the hell are you treating well? Yeah, or you know? or your janitors or like the security mm -hmm. people or you know every mm -hmm. it's literally everybody in this entire system because fundamentally they're still all workers and you know they deserve the best that and they deserve you know a, a more than a fair share. They deserve everything they have coming uh, exactly. to them. So but it does make kind of it make. It makes a kind of business sense, though, because you mistreat your janitors. It means there's worse cleaning is done. It means there's more diseases. It means there's, you know, more stuff to do clinical trials for. It's like it's, it's, it's a sound business circle. logic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to start moving towards wrapping this up. And then we do the, the article read, which is a bit um, <clears throat> more entertaining. Um, but in terms of like, if you look at the, the outcomes of a system like this, which is essentially like most of the UK right now is like it's just content to run the whole like the material side of everything into the ground while extracting more and more rents and profits out of the system as it exists and then devolving those rents and profits as debt onto the shoulders of like the next generation uh, as Eleanor as you said in the beginning so that they don't get a lot of them don't get ideas above their station and are just in debt peonage for the rest of their lives but like none of this works like in the long run this is you're going to kill the thing that that brings in the money as well not that capitalism understands the, the you know the long the long term in general i mean long term ism they do but not the long term um so <laughs> nothing good is going to come out of this unless you know the people in the system uh stand up for themselves and and make their voices heard and i think these strikes that are gonna hopefully we should get the results of the ballots i think next week eleanor am i right about that yeah that's right yeah we're so we're waiting we're waiting to hear back and i i'm feeling pretty optimistic about it um, if i do say so myself um just because i think that people are pretty hooked in and they're pretty mad you know um as they should and, be and, you know, we've, our industry, like everybody's, has gone through a lot um, in the pandemic. We've all worked a lot of free overtime. We've all done, uh, like, our best kind of, like, scrambling in order to provide things uh, for, you know, students. Um, whilst being told that we're the bad guys for, like, not wanting to put them in the germ box or whatever. Um, and then, but then having said that, like, the universities will do terrible things to our students, like, you know, I, I guess in the year of our Lord, 2020, when they tried to, like, make it, that happen again in, in the autumn, that was just because they wanted rent, right? Yeah. Like, they just they just wanted the rent off of students in halls. Um, and so I do think that, that we'll probably see, um, we, you know, we, we've had a pretty good uh, turnout thus far. I'm really, really kind of um, hoping that ECU is going to come through, but um, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for it. Yeah. 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 So having said all that, um, up the workers, and I think uh, we don't have common or common. We don't have common or commentary at this week, um, but it, you know, hey, if you see academics out on the picket line or uh, professional service out on the picket line, why not go say hello and support them uh, as you should? Uh, I don't know if there's a strike fund yet, but if there is one well, next week, we'll find out, and then we'll start linking that in the yeah, show notes as well. But uh, David, I think let us switch now to a. Um, an article, a great article that yes. I found in the Telegraph a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it's good. Um, right, uh, rather than give you the title and stuff, I'm going to give you the first couple of paragraphs first and then hit you with the title because it's just going to work better that way. Okay. Two friends of mine were asked at a dinner party for the characteristics they looked for in a man. Uh-oh. It depends on his brain pan, I think. <laughs> <laughs> One talked about a left-leaning, socially conscious guardian reader. Uh, okay, I thought you said left leaning and socially conscious. Yes. Wait, wait. <laughs> the other reeled off a memorable triptych. Likes pints, can ski, has a big dick. My instinct was to assume the more lascivious answer to be the truer, a rule for life. But I am beginning to doubt myself, because dating, it seems, has been swallowed by the culture walls and where once we had types, <laughs> now we have factions. Welcome to an article called Undateable at 29. Are my views too problematic for Hinge and Bumble? Yes. I, yes, no piece of shit. Like, I am my... a massive piece of shit and no one wants to date me. <laughs> Is this society's fault? This, this journalist says yes. Where, where is my government-appointed girlfriend? You know, I hate, I hate the, a large state except for when the ladies aren't like on the D immediately. Yeah. Why? I, uh, David, was this written 
Was this written by a woman? I, I for some reason, no. I've got a, no, <laughs> no. Okay. Also, I don't. Okay, right. so in, in the first place, you can tell it was written by a man because it's like because a girl said that she wanted a big dick. I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. That's what uh, that's what girls be talking about. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like that's not even how we talk about sex. Like, and I mean, I'm telling you as someone who talks about sex for a living. Like, sure, you meet your occasional size queen. They're out there. God bless you, girls. You're doing your thing. We don't care. Guys yeah, what women want that. is a perfectly no, no, no. G- cube girls, shaped head. Look, girls care about those perfect turns on the black slopes, and I know this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, uh, you know, the things that girls want are usually, you know, well, at least uh, hotties like me. You know, we're looking for people who are, like, kind and listen and are funny. Girls always say funny. That's what girls say. Yeah, so there you go. Tragically unrealistic standards, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was really, this, I'm trying to picture the kind of guy that likes pints and skiing, and I'm not coming not coming up with a, a favourable image in my head. Jamie, you can tell that you've never been skiing, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Baz on the slopes. <laughs> yeah. Politics is some dating into a perilous pursuit, says David Bates. Oh, okay, yeah, David, right. Yep. yep. He has no choice, David, he must. David Bateman, they're, they're complaining about his lack of dating. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Okay, normal. Of course, everyone still has their deal breakers. When I surveyed more of my female friends last week, their answers females. were persons. I surveyed the females. <laughs> <laughs> and I surveyed all of my female friends and, um, like, fucking nerd alert. Jesus. <laughs> Sending every woman that I know a fucking Google Doc to fill out. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, this motherfucker's walking up to him with a clipboard for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no one who goes to Dubai on holiday. No gamers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Critical support. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no just, dirty just in bathrooms. General. No one who wants to get married. One told me that she'd been on a date with a man who was grossed out by Rosie from outside Provence. So, Rob, I'm really sorry about that one. That's so fucking uncultured. They make great rosés in in, in Spain. Like, I'm sorry, but, like, get the fuck out of here. (laughs) But their responses were tribal too. From my skewed sample, all university-educated London dwellers aged between 24 and 33, there was a recurring theme. No Tories allowed. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, it boggles the mind because like, this guy's basically saying, listen, what I think about how the world should be ordered, what's right and wrong, what is moral, that should have no impact on what I get to stick my dick in. Like, these things should be entirely separate. And it just tells you so much about mm-hmm. how he sees women. If it says conservative on their hinge, it's a big fat no from me, one said. Another remarked that any non liberal vibes are a big turn off. Only a couple admitted that they had and would date a conservative voter, which mimics the trend I've noticed during a hefty stretch of singledom. Yeah, this is the problem. <laughs> like, it, it just it boggles my mind because it, the the idea here, like, and, and it is very, you know, ultimately conservative, right? But the idea here is that you can have, um, you know, a relationship with someone if your political views don't align. And it's like, well, my political in- views are, are like, A, like one of the most intrinsic things about me, but B, yeah, you're going to have to not harass my trans friends and family, right? Like you're going to have yeah. to like, you know, be able to be around poor people. You're going to like, th- these are like non-negotiables and you like telling my family members they needed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps harder isn't going to fucking go down very well if you're my life partner. So like, like the idea that this is all just a game is so conservative. Like, oh, it's this is just kind of like, um, you know, a party trick and the debates, like, I'm just doing this as, like, an intellectual exercise. So really, you should let me, like, uh, fucking put it in dry. You know, like, my God. I, uh, well, you, uh. I mean, the thing is, if, if someone did let him put it in, I guarantee it would be dry. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, Good God. <laughs> no, no, it is the women who are wrong. <laughs> exactly. It is exactly that. And it's just so funny to me, too, because, like, I mean, well, obviously... Like, you know, like, okay, so how would you, how are you going to shag me, like, a polyamorous Marxist, right? Like, it's it's just like, how's that going to work out for you? And they probably don't want to shag me, but they want me to say I would, I guess. Mm. 
right? I don't know. I think you underestimate the power of a hate fuck, Eleanor. Yeah, I know. Well, actually, <laughs> like I, I will tell you one thing. Actually, there are a lot of Tories at sex parties and things like that, and you have to be really careful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. My Hinge profile conveys the way I look, my hobbies, my occupation, my level of education, my vaccination <laughs> status, and my politics. <laughs> there's the option. The is, link dog bother is all of them. So. <laughs> my hinge profile conveys the length of my earlobes, the space between my eyes, the, <laughs> the, the span of my cranium. I like to call it the Vitruvian man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just I just suddenly had to freeze six inches undrilled underpants. Oh, <laughs> 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 <sighs> There is the option to display whether you are liberal, conservative, or moderate. What a dog shit app. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. Yeah, so, so I'm none of those things. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a secret fourth thing, so, you know, <laughs> good luck. I'm a secret third worldist. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Mine is set to liberal because I think it's true and because to do otherwise would be a romantic disaster. On Shut top of that... <laughs> Fucking hell. Mm -hmm. Just uh, get, getting out of a fucking Adam Smith and using it to daub your face like fucking camouflage. <laughs> like, amazing. On top of that, you answer prompts. Things like, I'm looking for, together we could, you should not go out with me if. I've looked at a lot of these profiles, read thousands of prompts, and never seen one <laughs> that criticises the Labour Party. <laughs> 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 oh baby! Oh god! Oh, Presumably, god. in a different social corral, they do exist. If if Truth Social ever <laughs> opens like a dating app, like that would be great for you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, those deriding the conservatives though are plentiful. One common response is the basic: "You should not go out with me if you are a Tory." And with that position comes a list of ideological requirements ostentatiously displayed, which feel incongruous with attraction. <laughs> well, 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 they're not. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you, Holmes. Like, it's, uh... <laughs> Hmm. It goes both. It goes both ways too. I was into this girl at university, and we were sort of in that stage where we were like hanging out in that "are we going to start dating" kind of way. And then she casually admitted about you know all the Tories and Republicans she dated and like oh. all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, "Nah, no way, not happening, not in a million years." Sorry, uh, I am not joining that particular fucking rogues gallery. <laughs> so the idea, like, I mean, I don't know. It probably says more about him and how he views, like, as far as he's concerned. I'm pretty sure he feels that women can't have actual valid opinions on things and, like, yeah. actual principles. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Like, the affectations. Well, I mean, that's the thing. He's all like, but I showed her my picture. It's like, I, I showed you my picture, please respond. Like, <laughs> are you telling... Eleanor, are you telling me about my raw animal magnetism hasn't overcome the fact that I'm an odious cunt? Yeah, like, I, like, that's the thing is, it's like, I don't know what this guy fucking looks like, but there, there's plenty of, you know, professionally good-looking people that I wouldn't shag because of their political opinions, you know? Like, are you joking? Like, no. Uh, Eleanor, da Eleanor, you are in Congress with attraction. Uh. <laughs> I know, like, just just the, the, the phrase, in Congress with attraction, is so funny to me. Like, yeah, I mean, if you're wondering what, what this guy looks like, Millhouse, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever he is, he's definitely a foggonal to fucking. Anyway, carry on. One prevalent prompt reads, Together we could dismantle the patriarchy. Aww, I mean, that's cute. No, that's really I mean, sweet. Lovely. Yes. I mean, yes, I'm up for it. Let's improve the world. But are you <laughs> sure that's the best place to start? Oh, is that how we we'll do it the weekend? Oh yeah, because because of the, guess what? Guess what, guys? The personal is definitely not political in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> and there's like really no room for feminism in interpersonal relationships. You know, like I, I don't know. This lady, see, she seems to be thinking a little too hard. On the weekend, you should be doing something like making me pancakes, shouldn't you, honey? Don't really think too hard. You might get a little wrinkle there. Fuck off. Let's put on makeup so the boys will like us. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. He's addressed this. I'm here for equality, brackets, promise. But shall oh, we have oh, dinner okay. first? <laughs> oh, well, that's me convinced. Yep. Yeah. What's your number, mate? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you know, I like the idea of equality, but I'm only going to deploy it to people who I have a successful dinner date with. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay, equality for you if you have sex with me. Mm. Basically. 
very sexy. See, I, I, I think this guy's problem is he he's not rich yet. You know what I mean? He wants yeah. he, he believes in conservative shit because he imagines one day he'll be the millionaire, but he isn't the millionaire, and so can't buy his way into a relationship with like a, a Tory woman. Mm, mm. Mm, yeah, true. Because yeah, the Tory women they're asking for receipts up front. They're like, um, <laughs> you know, uh, like to 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 quote outcast pardon me but are you balling you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> one woman is looking for a fellow lefty to build a queer feminist utopia with yeah that's right all right cool so cute does that mean you don't want to get drunk potentially snog and maybe one day combine our salaries so we can get a mortgage no <laughs> <laughs> she just told you that she wanted to build a queer queer socialist utopia so no <laughs> I think he just didn't understand what any of his words meant. Oh, That's the only yeah, possible yeah. reading but, of this. But have you considered that you know it, that, that the best place to build a queer feminist utopia is in a London basement apartment that costs seven figures, but, and but that you have to all, share with fucking Millhouse? The, the idea that you could just like snog anyone, so you don't want to get drunk and snog. Yeah, I want to get drunk and snog. Someone else who wants to start a queer feminist utopia with me. Like, what the fuck, man? Like, I don't. Ah, why is this so hard to understand? Another is searching for a vegan slash BLM ally slash intersectional feminist slash mm-hmm. climate change activist. Okay, yeah. And what? Mm-hmm. Those are your non-negotiables. Yeah. I am not deriding <laughs> their significance, and I, I couldn't date a climate change denial, but what relevance does this have to lover attraction? What about, what about luxurious hair and laughter and a nice face? <laughs> what does luxurious laughter, like luxurious hair, have to do with love? Oh my god! I mean, it's like, it's like that I thing. Mean, like when when some men say they want a, want a woman that, with a good sense of humor, they mean a woman that laughs at their jokes. Yeah, like, yeah. Man, man I want to see. What I want to see. Not. I want to see this guy's luxurious hair now. But also, no, like he just man he covers up, what he has not. He still admits that he couldn't date a climate change denier, so he knows what yep. we're talking about. He's like, but what about me? Also, you know. Yeah. This Thinking has gives you worried. wrinkles. <laughs> hmm. I'm nearly thirty. I'm single. Have I now inadvertently passed? I'm fucking shocked. (laughs) Have I now inadvertently passed into the most heinous category of undateable? Am I problematic? Yeah. After after all, I read a piece in The Economist last week. (laughs) Is anything to the right of Novara (laughs) Media beyond the pale? (laughs) (laughs) I watch Champions League football brackets for work. Am I endorsing <laughs> international air travel contrary to the aims of ecological socialism? Man, this guy did read The Economist for dating advice, and, and The Economist told him you can't, you can't possibly be unfuckable because that would be contrary to your rational self-interest. Mm. And he decided to write an article based on that. God damn. Yeah. Perhaps I'll just lie. I could be better off, and <laughs> it does start. seem to be what everyone else is doing. What? Wait, wait, wait. So his assumption is not, I'm just a fucking cunt. His assumption is, no, everybody else is just as shit as me. They're just lying about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're just virtue cool. signal. Yeah. Reality couldn't possibly be this different from the way that I am. Not not at all. Me, a costume Times journalist. Pedrish the thought. <laughs> Mm, yeah, mm. personally, I, th- I think nothing nothing gets me up the runway like knowing a prospective partner has written a whiny article in the papers about how no one will fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> really gets my motor going, that. Yeah, and girls and girls all over London are rubbing themselves right now. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really comforting with the guy who says, I read The Economist talks about international air travel. It's like, if you don't want to date me, I'm going to throw you out of the helicopter. Like, he has that kind of vibes to it. It's really... <laughs> <laughs> I might do a li- <laughs> Dear. For every friend who claimed that they'd never shag a Tory, I could think of one Tory they'd already slept with for reasons other than their politics. Because they were pretty, or funny, or charming. Is yeah. he just having a go at Milo here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a more mournful hot Tory thing. Well, I mean, like, it's, it's funny because like, I can't tell you that I haven't shagged a Tory, but if I did, they were lying to me. 
you know. Yeah. I mean, so. I think I've said on the pod, but I accidentally slept with um, what I'm pretty sure was a Nazi once, but I didn't know until afterwards. Oh. So what can you do? <laughs> oh. Yet those examples of star-crossed love could become a relic if our relationships continue to be filtered by a divisive algorithm. <laughs> but that's what it, isn't, it isn't the algorithm doing this it's not the algorithm doing this at all if, if, if what you're doing is reading people's bios the algorithm didn't do that because you saw them so the algorithm presented them to you that's their free will you just called their free will a divisive algorithm he's, this guy is bitching at the algorithm because he signed up and ticked for I'm a cunt box and now he doesn't understand mm. why you sorted him, sorted him into the cunt category mm-hmm. like he just doesn't get it do you reckon his, uh, his profile says, you shouldn't date me if you don't look good on the back of a milk carton? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, Christ. I'm looking for someone, who's, someone who looks chic chained to radio. Yeah, sure. <laughs> mm. I'm looking for someone who wants to play a game. <laughs> but this is the pattern. The Twitterization of life. Everything you believe must be believed stridently and broadcast widely. Your assumed ideology must be all-encompassing. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. we no longer yeah, live that's... in the 90s. Class conflict is back, motherfucker. Get the, sh- get it up, you. Get the fuck out of here. That's what an <laughs> ideology terrible, is, you know. The terrible modern disease of people having opinions. Yeah. A little fuck the Tories here. A little red rose emoji there. A New Yorker tote bag slung over the shoulder. Quote, yes, I'm liberal, okay, and I really, really mean it. I subscribed to the same £12 introductory offer as everyone else, and I cancelled it after the first 12 weeks. No, I'm not liberal, not... so I don't care. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I also, want like, I... the pretense to stop. I don't <laughs> want someone who is ideologically pure. I want someone who is beautiful and who makes me laugh. But I've said it now, definitely beyond the pale, so I suppose I'll just stay single. Good. Yeah. Fuck you. People up and down the yeah. nation breathing a yeah. sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> Why does he get to say beautiful too? Like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, I, I don't know. Like, you you will take I'll your kind of I'll post this picture lighting. in the chat. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Let's see. Hey, de- I definitely get the impression from this guy. He's the kind what? of person who tells, tells no. women to smile more. This man does not get to say beautiful. I'm sorry. This is this is a this is a, a C average Dark looking guy. Riley. Yeah, this is... <laughs> Dark Riley. Dark Riley. <laughs> <laughs> this man doesn't get to punch above a six. Sorry about it. No. Mm-mm. Also, this man with his little glass of wine does not get to piss about about rosé outside the Provence. Get the f- get the fuck out of here, you little <laughs> snobbag. He bag. looks like, for, for benefit of our listeners, he looks like a Lego man with a removable hairpiece. Like, <laughs> yeah. that, that's how he appears yeah. to me. He looks like you could click his hair off as one discrete unit. Also, it's a, it's a really interesting way of kind of like looking at attraction generally because it's like... You know, the thing about, you know, if one is indeed in love, for example, is that one becomes quite convinced that the person that they're in love with is the most attractive person that there is, irregardless, right? And the things that lead Mm. you to falling in love are often, you know, things like compatibility and politics and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you can be incredibly, like, horny for your partner and other people might not get it, but, like, that's not their fucking problem, right? Yep. And it, so, yeah. but he's just assuming the attraction is the thing, and that everything else will fall into place behind it, as opposed to you know the compatibility coming, and then attraction falls. It's just quite funny. What he what he wants what he wants is a participation trophy wife. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Eleanor, if you're telling me this man has never been in a serious relationship, I find that difficult to believe somehow. I just, I can't put my finger on why, this but guy, he seems to me... This guy extremely had, like, a relationship with a horse girl that was, like, yeah. five <laughs> years long. It was kind no, of like... yeah, his, his, his gambit going into, like, uni was to, like, meet a rich horse girl and then just, like, marry into the family money and then failed. And now he's like, now what the fuck do I do? Because he's yeah, being like, cast out of the horse girl scene. Yeah, he's fumbled it, like, three years post-uni. Do you know yes, what I mean? Yes, exactly. Where it's yeah, like, yeah. he thought it was going well, and now he's, like, single again. And, and he's, like, suddenly, instead of a split and rent with, with Imogen... He's like out here <laughs> on the dating scene and like uh, sharing a flat. He's very mad. <laughs> and it's I cold dated a horse out here. And all got is this lousy fucking column. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and it's cold out here in Bumble. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, um, may this may this guy remain unfucked. Uh, so yeah, I think that'll that'll do us for this week. Um, Eleanor, thank you very very much for joining us. Um, would you like to plug anything? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll plug away. Um, all right, so, we'll, we'll be so, here an hour while Eleanor know, does right? all her Sorry, multimedia yeah. projects. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the biggest thing at the minute that I am plugging is that um, my new book, which will be out in January, is now available for pre-order, and it makes a big difference if you pre-order things. Um, it's called uh, The Once and Future Sex, colon, uh, Going Medieval on Women's Roles in Society. It's a polemic about um, gender and women uh, more particularly. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, you can check out my blog, going-medieval.com. Um, and if you feel like reading a lot of Aristotle with me, I'm also teaching online with my friends at medievalist.net uh, starting in October in online a medieval gender and sexuality course that you could sign up to. Cool. Yes. And also mm. go listen to We're Not So Different, which is a good podcast that I also listen yeah, to. Yeah, I've got, I, for, I forget to plug my own goddamn podcast. Yeah, Luke and I are out here in the content <laughs> mines week in, week out, uh, and we're doing some stuff on the Holy Roman Empire this week, but we had a good one. If you want to hear what I think about the monarchy, uh, our episode last week uh, with a guest. Yeah, well, it's a banger. Uh, yeah, yeah, good guest. Yeah, I guess uh, Florence uh, Scott, who is another Marxist historian, and they've got a lot to say. So, yeah, check it out. Excellent. You can find us on patreon.com forward slash praxiscast. One bonus episode a month at the moment. That may be going up to two, so keep a little eye out for that. We'll announce that on the Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash praxiscast. You can also see us streaming uh, Thursday nights, which is twitch.tv forward slash praxiscast. And there is also the merch store, which is praxiscast.tml.com. So if you would like a t shirt, um, go there. Get your hottest summer on record shirt ready for next summer. Mm. Yes. Exactly. All right. And with all that said, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Or on the bonus, go Bye. subscribe. Bye. Yes. Cheerio. Bye. 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 Bye.